Welcome to our last office hours of the term. It's kind of crazy you guys have made it this far. I'm so proud of all you guys, especially the ones that are here every day live, you know, with me. You guys really like put in that extra effort and I hope it really paid off and you're happy with your grade so far, honestly. And I wish that I was coming and moving on with you guys into Orgo too, but I'm pretty sure Portmas is um, teaching all of Orgo too next semester. So unfortunately, I'll be sticking with Dr. Peterson and Dr. Havinick with the Orgo one kids. So, but I do have some resources, so you know, feel free to email me, and I can send you, you know, maybe the Orgo two workbook that I have for the class, or you know, some other Orgo two notes. Like, don't worry, like I can definitely send those to you guys. Okay, so we left off, sorry, my phone keeps moving, but uh, we left off last class with this issue with 8A on page 105, okay? And the original reaction conditions were these top ones right here. And remember, the first things that we wanna do is think about the substitution of that leaving group. And that leaving group is a secondary, okay? So that's already annoying because that's our gray area. Then we see this kind of KOET, you know, molecule, which really stands for potassium ethoxide. And, you know, if you, you separate those two ions, you see that we have a full negative charge on that oxygen, which makes it a strong nucleophile, as well as a strong base. Here, I'll put relatively, relatively strong nucleophile and strong base. Okay, and then ETOH is that polar protic solvent. Polar protic. Okay, so this is weird because if it was secondary with a strong nucleophile, I would think SN2, right? Okay, and that's what I drew last class. I showed the SN2 product, and you guys were like, the key says E2. And what I found out was is that it has to actually do with this solvent. Okay, and I talked about this, I, I found this out through Dr. Peterson, so I emailed her and we, we got this straight up squared away. Is that ethanol, because it's polar protic, actually decreases the nucleophilicity of this, but it doesn't affect the basicity of this, okay? Remember that polar protic solvent can solvate that nucleophile pretty well, which limits its ability to, you know, attack a center, but it has no, you know, significant effects in terms of like removing an adjacent proton, you know, maybe, you know, something like that, okay? So what happens here is we observe the E2 product and it's E2 because the nucleophilicity has kind of been, you know, reduced because of this polar protic solvent. And that's why we're going to get, you know, the E2 product, which is that. Okay. And remember that's the Zaitsev product. Okay. Zaitsev. Okay. And then what she said, what Dr. Peterson said in her email correspondence is that if we were to change, you know, the identity of this solvent to a pro polar aprotic solvent, polar aprotic, then you know, we still have that strong nucleophile, which is you know, in that polar A product medium, and that gives us you know, backside attack, and we can expect you know, potentially an SN2 product. Okay, so something to you know, think about and how to identify these on the test is this would have clearly told you SN2, right? I hope everybody in this, in this call right now knows that this pathway would have been SN2 100%. Okay, so if something in there, in your reagent conditions is slightly off, meaning this, you know, solvent, this polar protic solvent, which is not what SN2 likes, then you can go ahead and say it's E2. Okay, so clearly the only difference between these two is the identity of that solvent. Okay, any questions on that? I just definitely wanted to clarify that because I think it was a big issue last time. I just wanted to add on, I think she, I don't know if they said it verbatim, but like, I think practically like it's a rule, quote unquote, if um, the top, like the nucleophile or base is then, and then the solvent is just like the um, conjugate acid, then it is always E2, I think that's like. Okay, so if it's like kind of always that alcohol example, did someone say that in the notes? Or I'm pretty sure out? they said it in lecture. Okay. I don't want to like, I don't want to say for sure, but I. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, honestly, like that's basically what I just said in other words, so that that also works. I followed you. So the conjugate, this is what she's saying is the conjugate acid. Oh, you have any notes? Thanks. Thanks, Kate. So essentially, like what it is, is this is the protonated version of that, you know, base. So this is the conjugate acid. So that's what she's saying. If you have this base and the conjugate acid, you can always assume it's going to be the E2, you know, given that you have this secondary, you know, uh, lead group. Okay. Is everybody good on that? I'm happy that you guys seem to recognize that and, and notice that. 
that was our issue last time. Okay, awesome. So let's jump into chapter 10. We're gonna cover a whole bunch of alcohol reactions and they're really not bad, honestly. I think the hardest part was chapter nine. So you guys know chapter eight in and out. Um, chapter 10 will be really easy for you guys. And chapter nine is just that one that you wanna always keep working. Just keep doing examples of all of those SN1 and SN2 if you want to. Okay, so moving on to the workbook, we're gonna be on page 111. Okay, so the, this reaction, this is the first reaction in the alcohol chapter, okay? And it's called alkoxide synthesis. And we've talked about alkoxide anions, like when we were doing, uh, you know, the SN2 reactions. Remember, those alkoxide anions could tend to be very strong nucleophiles, and they like to add in to, um, you know, alkyl halides. So we're going to see that actual reaction here. And in order to make um, our our alkoxide anion, we can use two reagents, one of two reagents. So we can either use sodium hydride, which is A, or we could use some pure metal. And typically you see this not symbol, but it was hard to you know, type on the computer with that. So typically you see pure elemental sodium, potassium, or lithium, two equivalents, or you can see like sodium hydride, potassium hydride, you know, um, those sort of hydride molecules, so these two types of things. And what happens is we know that these protons are acidic because if you two remember, do that same thing back to, you know, orgo one and you were to, you know, scribble out and put a ne negative charge, what happens is, is that the negative charge is stabilized because it's a very electronegative atom, remember? So that's why these are relatively acidic, these molecules. So what that sodium hydride is, is it's positive sodium ion with this hydride, nucleophile slash base, okay? So what it's gonna do is mechanistically is remove that proton and then that electron density is going to be retained on the oxygen, okay? So really simple, you know, reaction here. And then you're left with that. And then to be, you know, really specific, you can put sodium positive here, you know, obviously you wouldn't be marked off, but you know, that is the spectator ion complexing with that anion. Okay, so nothing crazy here. This, for this reagent, we don't know the mechanism for that, but it does the exact same thing as before. So let me just fix this. Um, ah, stay put. Sorry, guys. So you can do the exact same, you know, reaction conditions. I mean, different reaction conditions here, and get you know a very similar product. So here we get just that, and you don't have to, you know, draw that mechanism. Okay. So that's that. So you can clearly see that it's a way to generate these alkoxide anions, which can later be used as nucleophiles with alkyl halides. And speaking of that's letter C. So this again, step one is sodium hydride, and it's going to remove that proton, okay? And now I form that alkoxide intermediate, okay? And then that alkoxide intermediate can do an SN2 reaction with our reagent in step two, okay? And the why I knew it was SN2 is this big, you know, clue right here with that DMF solvent. But also, if you drew out the line angle structure of, you know, that ethyl bromide, which is, you know, this primary alkyl halide, you can see that that's, you know, a primary starting material, a very strong nucleophile in aprotic conditions, SN2. Boom, boom. So then you are left with, and always make sure you have the right amount of carbon. So here, there is one, two, here, one, two, okay? So that specific reaction in C is called William Ether, Williamson ether synthesis. Williamson ether synthesis. Um, not like super important that you know the name, but when you guys go to organic lab, I actually work in the orgo lab. So for those of you guys that are taking orgo lab, you might see me there in the stock room. Um, I help make the chemicals and stuff. But um, Williamson ether synthesis is actual is an actual lab that you guys can do um, with the reflux condenser. So this is a pretty cool one that you'll actually be able to do in lab. For fun. All right, so D. Okay, so again, one is water and acid with an alkene. Well, that was literally like the second reaction we learned in this class. So that's going to be Markovnikov addition for an alcohol. Okay, so that's step one. Then step two is going to be sodium hydride, just deprotonating, you know, that proton. And then step three is another SN2 reaction with, you know, this uh, alkyl halide. And, you know, luckily we don't have to consider any stereochemistry yet. And it's one carbon in the ring. So one carbon in the six member ring. So that's one and that's one, okay? So again, that's another example of Williamson ether synthesis, but we added some other things before. Okay, so E, so we have 
boring and, and you know, the sodium hydroxide. So, you know, one and two is going to be that hydroboration of alkenes to form that alcohol. So we would expect, you know, an alcohol at that position, you know, the less substituted position. And then step three is going to be, you know, two equivalents of pure sodium metal is going to form that alkoxide anion again. And then this looks like just methyl bromide. So that's going to be another SN2 reaction. So we're going to be left with this product. One, two, and just one carbon. Okay, so that's that. So before we had one, two on that substituent and then that oxygen and then the third. Okay, any questions on forming alkoxide anions or Williamson ether synthesis? Um, just to clarify, those steps one and two, those always go together, right? Yes, yes, okay. correct. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, that honestly was a big thing for me in Orgo one is like, I like look at everything in isolation. Like I would do only step, I'm like, okay, I know step one is hydroboration, but I forgot that step two was like those stupid reagents that we don't really necessarily know the mechanism to. Right. So just make sure that the two of them, the two reactions that you need that for is oxymercuration, which is the HGOAC2 guy, THF, sodium borohydride step two, and then the hydroboration one, which is what you see right here. So just keep those two in mind. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, so this one, reaction 26, um, honestly, people always have a lot of trouble with this one. So I'm just gonna kind of show you guys what not to do or, or just some things to think about like with these. These are really easy. So I, I don't really ever understand why people mess these ones up. But the key is this last sentence, um, is that then the halide can either attack the carbon that bears the protonated alcohol in this SN2 fashion or attack carbocation, yada, 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 in an SN1 fashion. So the thing is, is that sometimes people don't see that you really have to consider SN1 and SN2 here. So why is that? So when we have these acids, hydrobromic acid, hydrochloric acid, you know, these are the ones that we saw, you know, back with um, hydrohalogenation, what happens is the acid is going to protonate, you know, that alcohol. So the alcohol is just like water, it's amphoteric. Before we saw it was acting like a base, you know, we could deprotonate those protons, but we could just as equally of likely have protonated them. Okay, so that leaves us with this kind of intermediate. Okay. Okay, and we also generate free bromide. Okay, so we get this, you know, good leaving group now. So we, we've talked about bad leaving group, okay, because it's not stabilized on its own. You know, this would just be plain that. And then if this were to leave on its own, it's literally water. And we know water is neutral and stable on its own. So yes, definitely a good leaving group now. But this is a primary leaving group, okay? So primary leaving group, we always said no thinking, SN2. Why is it SN2? Because that bromide can squeeze right in there, attack that carbon, and facilitate that removal. So in this situation, it's going to be that SN2, okay? And there was no stereochemistry here, but you would have to obviously consider that if we were at a secondary um, leaving material, leaving group. Okay, kind of good so far. So we're gonna see different examples of SN1 or maybe decide between the other versions and whatever. Okay, so for G, steps one and two, again, those two are together, that's hydroboration. So that forms this, you know, alcohol, okay? And then step three protonates it, okay? So we're there. And then that chloride anion can just do that same backward attack. Again, no stereochemistry to consider yet. So that's an example, again, of that same thing, okay? Any questions so far? Awesome, okay, so let's keep going. Okay, so you can see something's changing here based on the substitution, if you guys can just kind of see ahead. So what happens is that happens. We get Okay. And then since this is a tertiary leaving group or tertiary starting material, I don't even know what you want to call it, it's going to do an SN1 mechanism path mechanistic pathway, not an SN2 mechanistic pathway, because a carbocation intermediate is more stable. So we would get, and because of this, a lot of people forget to do rearrangements here, okay? There isn't one for this specific example, but people forget to do rearrangements, okay? And I think we're, you guys are, might see me on, on I, okay? So what happens now is we have this carbocation, that's tertiary, it's pretty stable, and that free bromide could come and attack. But remember what we talked about with carbocations, they are unhybridized P orbitals there. So I could attack the front or the back phase. So you would have to write both 
you know, major enantiomers. So we would actually, in this case, there is no <laughs> and it's chiral center generated, but if there was one, you would have to consider both the wedge and vaginal orientations, okay? So this would be an SN1 type fashion, okay? Okay, so for I, we know, remember, when we use oxymercuration conditions, we're still going to get that Markovnikov alcohol in the more substitute position. But remember, specifically throughout this mechanism, there was no carbocation form. So we never saw any rearrangement. So what happens from step one and step two is literally just an alcohol at that position. And then with step three, okay, we're going to have, you know, the hydrogen, you know, come here and make this a good leaving group. And then, hmm. It could, it's that secondary. So we can think SN2 or we could argue SN1. It's gonna be SN1 because the driving force is alleviating that ring strain. So we're gonna get, you know, this classic example of a ring expansion. And we can draw, you know, that happening. And we get this structure. And then bromide can come in and attack here. And we would get, you know, four major stereoisomers. Okay, so yeah, just be careful with these carbocation rearrangements and, and these and these SN one SN two things. You know, this is kind of really piecing it all together. All right, any questions so far on what we did there? It was the same exact reagents. It was some sort of acid, so hydrobromic acid, hydrochloric acid, whatever. I'll show it again, and it, you just have to really think if it's going to be SN one or SN two, and that's just going to give you the types of stereoisomers that you see. Okay. Let's move on to the next reaction. So the next two are kind of similar. So it's um, phosphorus tribromide reagents and thionyl chloride reagents. So what are those? So for this reagent, you know, these are the very few things that I would tell you to memorize in terms of Lewis structures. You definitely want to know what PBR3 looks like in its Lewis structure. And you definitely want to know what thionyl chloride looks like in its um, Lewis structure. So what they look like is this. This one's easy. Just phosphorus with, you know, three bromides. Okay, and mechanistically, so remember, we talked about alcohols being poor leaving groups, okay? So this lone pair is going to attack that phosphorus and it, you know, forces that bromide out. So phosphorus can be lower than the normal oxide configuration. Okay, so then we're left with this product or this intermediate, I should say, um, of PBR, PBR, and this is a, very, very good leaving group now. Remember when we protonate, you know, some sort of group, um, it becomes a good leaving group. And for the question, I, Dr. Peterson told us to replace the third step with PBR3. So this, so I don't think she wants to think about carbon kind of arrangements. Um, David, I totally understand what you're saying with that. Um, I, don't agree with that last sentence though. She definitely will want you to think about carbocation rearrangements. Like, let's say it was something like this. Like, you know, let's say it was, you know, a secondary and you could have done like an, a hydro, I'm oh, sorry, I'm not showing it. Let's say this was a secondary, maybe not ring expansions per se, but um, you can do, like if this was a secondary, you can just do a hydride or an alkyl shift and that was a potential rearrangement you could do. Um, They're saying I like on the key they replaced for number three that she put PBR3 instead of the HBR. Oh, this guy? I see. Yeah. This PBR3. Okay. This guy wouldn't be the ring expansion. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So then that would make sense. Okay, so I guess consensus wise, she's not going to have you do ring expansions in terms of rearrangements, but in terms of alkyl or hydride shifts, those are definitely valid, I feel like. Or, or fair game, you know, but the ring expansion one, that makes sense. Okay, cool. Awesome. Glad we got that. Okay, so we're here. So this is a good leaving group. And then we have free bromide, you know, from this step. Okay, because of this, because that I generated free bromide, like nucleophiles here, the only way that it's going to attack is if it's in an SN2 fashion, okay? So that's why we're limited when we're doing phosphorus tribromide or thionyl chloride reagents to primary or secondary alkyl halides, okay? So what that means is, we're always gonna observe inversion of configuration, okay? And then your end product is gonna be uh, HOPBR2. And you don't need to write this, you don't need to write that, but that is the product that leaves, okay? So SN2, in the sense that phosphorus tribromide is a nice reagent that generates that free bromide, 
and it comes and attacks the back base, so SM2. Okay. So now K should kind of give you some insight onto what I was just talking about. So with this reagent and, and this specific you know, substitution for that alcohol, why do I write hint? Well, it's because there's actually no reaction. No reaction. And there's no reaction because you'll see once you generate you know, that intermediate, so you could technically argue that this does happen. So maybe this is your product per se. Um, I'll draw it down here. P, uh, BR, BR. You know, maybe that is your intermediate, you can argue. But that free bromide definitely cannot do SN2 with a tertiary leaving group. So we can't do this. That is not going to happen, okay? So that's why no reaction happens. So we are limited to the secondary or primary alcohols to begin with, okay? Cool. So let's do L. So why are we limited to an SN2 mechanism for this again? Because, Taylor, when we... And this, because organic chemists picked this reagent on purpose, and we'll see it again with thionyl chloride, SOCl2, they both do this kind of concerted, uh, not concerted, they both do these two arrows where you generate an halogen anion, and because you generate that specific halogen anion, it's always an SN2 reaction after, okay? Just because of the specific reagents that they decided to come up with, honestly. Yeah, nothing, nothing more beyond that. Um, okay, cool. Um, so let's keep going. So for L, so again, acid catalyzed hydration. So just think alcohol here, but it could have been a wedge or a dash. We don't know. Remember, like this went through a carbocation intermediate. We could argue that it's both wedges or dashes. And then phosphor tribromide can do this reaction because it's secondary. But if one is a wedge and one is a dash, we would expect, you know, both um, alkyl halide um, in antimers. So we would expect, you know, this one and this one. Okay, those two. That kind of makes sense. I, I think it's what is so difficult about these reactions is, you know, this major stereoisomers and knowing when I have to draw them, when I don't, you know, there's a, now we're at that very complex level. Okay, so M. So M looks like a bulky base. I have ter terbutoxide anion with terbutanol, and that is going to form the Hoffman alkene. Okay, so that's going to form, you know, this, this molecule, anybody know this? Someone put this in the, top, in, the top, in the chat box, the name of this molecule. I'll be really impressed if someone knows what this is. It's, I use it in my radical um, polymer reactions all the time. It's a plastic that you use. It's styrene. So this is the styrene monomer that forms polystyrene, and that's in your plastic water bottles. So pretty cool. Anyway, so you get this kind of base. I mean, you get this... Um, bulky base that forms this Hoffman product. And step two is just acid catalyzed hydration again. So we're gonna form you know, that alcohol at the benzylic carbon. Okay, and then again, we don't know if this was wedged or dashed because this went through a carbocation intermediate here. So then three, we know that's SN2, so we would have both you know, um, uh, alkyl halides. So we would have All right, and that's that. Okay, so then for step two, what are we looking at? Um, uh, Mohammed, do you have a question about step two? Is it wedged, uh, is it wedged or dashed or both? Um, are you talking about step two on M specifically? Like, yeah, so for step two, like you said, you don't know if it's wedged or dashed. Is it like oh, both yeah, wedged so and dashed? Yeah, it's both. So essentially what happens after step two is you get these two products. You get so you get those two. So then both of those can react with PBR3. And since it's SN2, that's why you get both of these. Does that make sense? Yeah, cool. Okay, so for N, same thing. So I'm not gonna draw the mechanism, but you can imagine that it just gets that whole big leaving group. And then bromide comes in and attacks as an SN2. And that, okay, so I think that makes sense. Definitely know this mechanism. It is always tested, like literally always tested, okay? Sometimes it might be like, out of the following, select the Lewis structure of the intermediate, which would be like this guy, you know? And that's, if only you would only get that if you knew the Lewis structure of PBR3, okay? So it's important. Any questions on phosphorus tribromide? 
So thionyl chloride actually reacts the same way, does the exact same thing, except you can tell because there's chlorides here, we're gonna form like, like chloroalkanes, not bromoalkanes. Um, I actually use thionyl chloride a lot in my research lab. Thionyl chloride smells disgusting. Like it is the worst smelling chemical I think I've ever come across. And it's like, it's like literally like a garbage truck. It, it's just so pungent. And what pyridine is, is pyridine acts as proton sponge. So you'll see, we're gonna generate some sort of excess of protons and that excess of protons is gonna be consumed by that pyridine. You don't need to know like anything specifically about pyridine. It's just this kind of aromatic molecule, looks like this. It's just gonna be able to like get pronated essentially. So like right now it's normally like this, but then when there's protons in solution, it becomes pronated and it's just really stable because why resonance, yada, yada, yada. So um, point is, is that it's a proton sponge. It stabilizes that acidity. You don't need to know anything for the mechanism though. Okay, so SOCO2, another, you know, Lewis structure I would know, so let me write it up here. So it's literally not, it's not the biggest deal in the world, but um, if anybody knows what this structure is, this is called phosgene. Phosgene is used to make, um, I know I'm giving you guys all these old chemicals, but maybe this helps you guys remember the Lewis structures. Phosgene is actually the chemical that's used in um, uh, um, like poisonous gas, like to, um, like, uh, I don't even know like what it is, like, you know, the tear gases and, um, other things like that, like, like in war and stuff. So phosgene is that actual chemical. And then if you replace that carbon with a the sulfur, then you're at thionyl chloride, okay? This one doesn't kill you, okay? Well, kind of if you, if you drink it, but you know, not as mad as this one. So thionyl chloride, okay? So just maybe that helps you guys. Anyway, so what happens here is the mechanism looks like this. So I'm gonna draw that down here. So this one's a little bit weirder. It has to do with that carbonyl or thionyl. So what happens is that sulfur gets attacked, okay? And you get, a t and you get those lone, uh, these, these pi electrons forming a lone pair, okay? So we didn't generate chloride yet, okay? Which was different than what we saw with the bromide example is, uh, I'm gonna run out of space. Um, okay, so we're here. And this is a key part in the mechanism. The oxygen anion now will collapse, okay? And release a chloride, okay? And that is very similar to what we saw with phosphorus tribromide, where we generate that free bromide for an SN2 mechanistic pathway. So here, we now have this and free chloride, and then free chloride can just do that SN2 reaction, and facilitate the removal. So you get oops, chloride. Okay, so just a couple of key things. First of all, this specific reaction with this, you know, attacking a carbonyl and then putting it back down is all of orgo too. Okay, so every orgo2 reaction, for the most part, that you're going to deal with is going to do stuff with that. So that's kind of what orgo2 is, where you guys are going. But um, right now, um, you guys have this. So it's just the same thing. Um, SN2, inversion of configuration, limited to primary and secondaries only. Okay. So let's just try this one. Again, quick predict the product. You know that this is going to form that. Intermediate. Okay. And then let's see, what's that intermediate usually tested on? Yeah, Hannah, so uh, same same type of thing that I said with phosphorus tribromide, like you could very well, like, you know, maybe on a multiple choice question be like, it'd be like, what is the key intermediate of this reaction shown? And this would be the one that you would wanna select. And then for the thionyl chloride, it would also be this guy, oops. Well, I mean, she would have to be specific, you know, you can argue that this is a key intermediate and so is this one. Um, so if she would be specific, like maybe what is the key immediate with only one charge? What is the key immediate with only two charges? You know, uh, so that would clearly be one or the other. Um, but yeah, definitely know those. It, it always comes up. Yeah. Um, okay. So anyway, so you know that this happens and then chloride comes and attacks on the back face. So do, do, do. there. Okay. I think you guys are getting better at these. Um, so step for Q, that's hydroboration step one and step two. So that's going to form, you know, this anti-Markovnikov alcohol. Um, Oops, I dropped a carbon. Okay, and then step three is going to be an SN2 reaction. Again, no stereochemistry to consider here. So, boom, 
but actually there is stereo chemistry considered. We generated a chiral center in the process. So we have that one, and then you know, also I'll should say the dash one as well. So okay. okay, so okay, wow. You guys see that we can, even though that your fourth exam isn't cumulative, it like is cumulative, like kind of. Like we're not like going out of our way to be like draw Newman projections, draw like get a gauge confirmation, things like that. But in terms of your main reagents and reactions, like those you should all know, especially for coenzyme to orgo too. So they're kind of fair game. Okay, so step one, step two, we know that's going to be alkyne preparation, specifically, you know, acetylide forming that acetylide anion and then reprotonating it. So we would expect, you know, one, two, three, four, five. So one, two, three, four, five. Okay. So we're here. One, two, three, four, five. And then three is going to be sodium, pure sodium, metal, and ammonia, which is going to form that reductive E alkene. Okay. So that's going to be one, two, three, four, five E alkene. And then step four and five is going to be doing hydroboration conditions to form that anti Markovnikov alcohol. And then step six is going to be that thionyl chloride SN2 pathway. So we would expect that as our product. All right. So it's kind of like a mini synthesis, like in your head. Okay. Except everything's shown. Okay, and then for S, I'm not going to show the full thing, but you can imagine that we would have inversion of configuration there. Okay. All right, we're almost done, guys, I promise. So, those phosphorus tribromide and thionyl chloride, very similar things. Okay, so definitely not too bad. Here, this is weird. So, the key thing here is this last sentence. This reaction is extremely useful in synthesis. Wink, 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 wink write this down, highlight it. You're probably gonna get a synthesis like every year when we have these exams, there's always a synthesis that involves at least this step, okay? Because of how important it is in manipulating the stereochemistry of our products. Okay, so definitely think when you're doing your synthesis on the test, did I use aerial sulfonate conversion? Because the odds are that's probably not, I'm not telling you that it is, just saying that, definitely think about that. Okay. So what is tazo chloride? Well, this is toluene, okay? Toluene is just a benzene with a methyl group. And tazo chloride is like the same thing as thionyl chloride, I believe. So it looks like, if I remember correctly, I think it's that, something like that. And then maybe another one. Yeah, pretty sure it's that. Someone fact check me if somebody has their notes in front of them. I think that's the Lewis structure. I haven't worked on this one more. I'll wait until someone says it. Uh, I think there's like two double bond O's and then one chlorine. Two to O oh, instead of this one. Yeah, I think it's it. like. Yeah, I knew something was something. I don't really remember that one. Okay, so whatever. So know your Lewis structures. Don't be like me. Know this Lewis structure, and essentially, you don't need to know your mechanism. Uh, at least when I took this class, I don't think you have to know the mechanism. Did she add the mechanism on this on for this specific reaction? I didn't see that in the notes when I checked. Somebody wants to verify that. Yeah, no, she didn't. Great. Okay, cool. Um, so mechanism not important for this one, but the structure is important, especially for you DAT, dental exam people, MCAT people, med school, whatever. They test this reaction a lot for some reason. I don't know why. They just test this one a lot. So keep that in mind, I'm trying to help you guys. So what it is, is it's going to form something called OTS, and it's going to have the exact same stereochemistry. No thinking. So if you want to just kind of memorize that, it's that. Okay, and what it is, it's just basically that O with this tosylate. TS stands for tosylate, okay? And that's what this tosyl chloride is. This tosylate group gets added onto that alcohol, and just abbreviation. So remember, we see like LDA stands for lithium, dialuminum, whatever, blah, blah, blah. This one is, you know, just another abbreviation, OTS. But keep in mind, we had that configuration down at dash. We're going to retain that configuration here. That's it, okay? Well, and you're, maybe you're asking yourself, what's the point of this? The point is, is that like it's converting this bad leaving group into a good leaving group, but still maintaining this, you know, stereochemistry. Okay, so LDA, bulky base, we're going to get the Hoffman product here. 
So we're getting here and here. Step two and three is going to form the anti-Markovnikov alcohol. So that's this and this. Again, there's no specific stereochemistry here to consider, but you would know that it retains itself. So you guys can just say OTS and that. And that is your product. Okay. Um, for V, so V. So that one has some stereochemical considerations to consider. And we would just, oh, sorry, I did the wrong thing. Here we would have OTS, really easy. Okay. This is why it's important specifically for a letter W. It's because if we wanted to specifically get like, I don't know, like one specific type of molecule, and let's say in the synthesis, and this one doesn't really become clear, but we have tosyl chloride and it basically keeps that configuration as OTS. And then azide, remember, and acetone with the secondary leaving group is all SN2 fashions. So we can keep manipulating the stereochemistry back and forth. Wedge, dash, dash, wedge, dash, wedge. And you can see by using that, if you wanted to maybe do a step where you wanted to manipulate the chemistry on purpose, this would be like, you know, very good, you know, option. Okay, so let's look at X. So Br2 and light, that is going to be a radical reaction that adds a bromine to the more substitute position. So that's maybe here. I think she took this out and wanted me to say LDA. So that's a bulky base, and that's going to give us, again, this Hoffman product. So that's acid-catalyzed hydration here. And that's going to add to the more substituted position. Okay, and then remember, this could have been wedged or dash, so we could have that tosylate on either the wedge or dash configuration, but this isn't a chiral center, so you would just be expected to say OTS and that. Really easy, honestly. You guys just would have to know to say OTS. Okay, we're on reaction 30. Um, dehydration. People hate these, again, I, I, it, it goes through a carbocation intermediate, maybe that's why. So same type of thing that we saw, this is just instead of hydrobromic or hydrochloric acid, it's gonna get protonated into a good leaving group. So then it becomes, you know, this intermediate. Okay. And then what happens is, is it is going to leave on its own, okay, in an SN1 fashion. And uh, we get this intermediate. And it is prone to rearranging. You know, in this case, we can see a four to a five membered, I mean, a five to a six membered ring. And we would get that. Okay, and then the conjugate base of the acid, which would be HFO4 minus, can do this E1 scheme. Where is this, where is this? Uh, I can take any proton, it wouldn't matter. Would, would that be a six-membered ring? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, appreciate it. Um, here we go, and we can take a proton, remove it, you can tell it's been a long day. <laughs> All right, and then we're there. Okay, so I think why people think alcohol chemistry is so difficult is they forget about all the little nuances that, you know, in terms of SN1, SN2 rearrangements, like stuff like that. So just make sure you're like thinking logically, like definitely go into this test, like thinking about all these reagents because this is the test out of all the tests to do that. All right, so again, here we're gonna do this protonates. Now you form that. Uh, we get water here can leave on its own you get you know let me just draw this smaller that and you can see the subsequent shifts to that you know you're going to do two consecutive shifts you're going to do a hydride shift to get to that tertiary position then you do another hydride shift to get to the tertiary benzylic position so you know you're going to have a carbocation here and then you're going to have that base you know come in and remove so you're going to get the product that looks like this Okay. And pH stands for benzene. But no. Okay, so here, same type of thing, except we're going to lose the stereochemistry of this wedge. And when that gets protonated, you know, you can imagine that we're going to get that. Okay, any questions on these? All right. And heat, that delta just means heating, like obviously, like to dehydrate something or to remove this water because water is our leaving group. Why do we have minus water? We've never seen that before. Well, minus water is shown because the specific reaction 
is pulling water. And, and we have this, uh, actually, let me, this is actually worth showing you guys. Um, let me pause for one second. Okay, so I'm going to actually share, attempt to share this screen with you guys and show you this really cool thing. So I hope you guys can all see this. So this specific apparatus is called the Dean Stark Trap. And I've come across it a couple of times and you guys will as well in, in your Orgo lab when you guys do it. Um, but what happens is it's specifically engineered to pull water out of the system. And what happens when you pull a product out of a system your gen chem, your gen chem knowledge should be coming back to you. And that's Le Chatelier's principle in action. If you're pulling a product away, you shift the equilibrium more towards the products. And that's exactly why we have minus water in all of these dehydration conditions. So what happens is, is as you heat it up, this is a heat, a heat oven. As you heat it up, water vapors will rise. Okay, rise through this column, keep rising all the way up here. And what funnels through this, it's a sleeve, is cold water and that cold water condenses these water vapors that are inside that tube and they fall out this pipette into a waste bin. So it's literally Le Chatelier's principle in action. So um, I don't know, thought that's cool because it's definitely gonna come up in your Orgo lab. All right, let's go back. All right. So let's do a couple more. Um, okay. Actually, let's leave these two for you guys. I want to keep moving. You guys know how to do this. It's just dehydration. We saw that already. So oxidation. So this is going to be really important going into Orgo too. You're going to kind of like pick up on these in chapter 16. So um, we need to make the delineation right now between strong and weak oxidants. And what, do, what does that mean? So we're going to go to a separate paper right now. And we're going to just kind of draw this reaction scheme. This is really good for you guys to write down. So primary alcohol. So I'm going to say R O H. So that's a primary. Okay. We can either do weak conditions and that gets us to here. Okay. So we can call that an aldehyde or we could have done stronger conditions to get here. Okay. And you're going to learn that you could also do strong conditions from here to here, but that's Orgo too. Don't worry about that. So for right now, this is all we know. Weak conditions with a primary alcohol, and I'm going to say in brackets, OX, that just stands for oxidants, oxidizing conditions. Okay. So if it's a weaker condition, we're going to stop at this aldehyde. But if it's a stronger condition, we're going to go all the way to that carboxylic acid. So what is a weak oxidant and what is a strong oxidant? Well, our weak oxidants, the only one we know of is something called PCC. I have no idea what it stands for, honestly. DCM. And sometimes you'll see that DCM solvent, or remember DCM was dichloromethane. Okay, so PCC and DCM are common with weak conditions. And there's a couple of different strong oxidants that we can see. There are these chromates, okay? So you might see like Na2Cr2O7, you know, with acid, you might see the potassium version, you might see something called Jones's reagent. The Jones's reagent is a complex of all these like chromate things, the Jones's reagents, and those are kind of the, anytime you see oxygen with these metals, that's a very, very big sign that you're gonna be doing oxidation, okay? Anyway, point is, is that if you, these are the only examples that we have. The weak one is that one PCC example, and all the strong ones are going to be these chromates or Jones's reagent. So just make sure you guys know those. Okay, so the, or in terms of gener general chemistry, oxidation is losing electrons. Reduction is gaining electrons. The definition is different for organic chemistry now. Nah, I know this sucks. So oxidation, the definition in orgo, and this has been tested before, like in terms of like a theoretical, like fill in the blank question, like what is the orgo definition of oxidation? Like gaining or losing this. So the organic definition of, of oxidation is the gaining of a carbon oxygen bond and the loss of a 
carbon hydrogen bond. Okay, so if you were to think about oxidation, kind of this line makes sense. Oxidation of a carbon hydrogen bond, you can assume that hydrogen in that bond has these electrons, so it's basically like losing electrons. So that makes sense. But what doesn't make sense is this gaining of a carbon oxygen bond. And it does, like, we don't need to go into like the complete, you know, biochemistry of all of it, but um, just know that this is the organic definition right now. And if you want to know, email me and I can totally tell you. So reduction conditions are going to be the opposite. So it's gaining the CH bond, but loss of the CO bond. So that makes sense. Like, look, in all these situations, we went from one carbon oxygen bonds to two carbon oxygen bonds to three carbon oxygen bonds. And you might be asking yourself, well, where am I losing these protons? Well, there were two there. So we lost one of them there. And then we lost the second one there. Okay. And we have this whole OH thing. Okay. So maybe that's going to give you some insights onto um, like maybe some easy questions on the test. I don't know. Uh, yeah, let's keep moving. So that's really all I want you guys to know is oxidation is left to right and reduction is going to be right to left. And you guys will do reductions when you get to orbit. So we're back here. Oh, sorry, one more thing. And what happens if we ha don't have primaries? What happens if we have secondaries or tertiaries? So if we have a secondary, let's draw that. So that would be... It's clearly secondary. And we can only do one thing. Notice that no matter if it's weak or strong, you get the exact same thing. Okay, so it doesn't matter in, in, in the sense of your secondary reagent because both of them can only get here. You can't add any, so because it's secondary specifically, and here we have two hydrogens, we don't have as many hydrogens to play with. So we can only do one round of you know, oxidation, not multiple, okay? And it has to do with like the available protons. Okay, and then what happens if you have a tertiary? None. Okay, you can't have any oxidation of tertiary alcohols because why? What's the definition of oxidation in organic chemistry? It's losing a carbon hydrogen bond and you cannot lose any more carbon hydrogen bonds because I don't see any carbon hydrogen bonds. Okay, so that's why there are none. And by carbon hydrogen bonds, I mean carbons attached to the alcohol. So you see over here, that's what I'm talking about. So attached to the alcohol, we have two, one, zero. Two protons, so two rounds. I'll move this. One proton, run around. Zero protons, no rounds. Okay? Because there are two protons, I can do two subsequent oxidation steps. Because there is one proton, I can do one oxidation step. Doesn't matter the conditions. Because there are zero protons, I can do no rounds because that's the definition of oxidation. Does that maybe make some things more clear for you guys? Okay. I assume so. All right, we're going to finish up with these. So first thing you want to do is classify your substitution and also classify the weak, the strength of your oxidant. So we can either be strong or weak. Here we are strong. It's one of those chromates. Okay, here we have a primary. Here we have a secondary. Here we have a tertiary. Well, we know tertiaries won't react, so we're going to leave that tertiary the way that was. The secondary, we know it doesn't matter if it's strong or weak, it's going to get to that ketone. And that primary is going to, because of strong conditions, go all the way to the carboxylic acid. Okay, so basically you can expect some crazy looking molecule like that. Okay, so every functional group that's in there is fair game to be in terms of being oxidized, if it's capable of being oxidized. Okay, so for EE, we're going to have hydroboration conditions that adds an alcohol to this position. So remember that, that could have came, became chiral, so let's watch out for that. And step three, that's Jones, so that's also strong. So strong oxidants make carboxylic acids. Okay, but this is a secondary, you know, alcohol. So secondary alcohols can only go to their ketones. And then because of that, we have, you know, this racemization of that methyl substituent on that ring in that alpha position. Okay. 
So for FF, so that stereochemistry and the starting material actually goes away. So we have secondary, secondary, and primary. And this is weak oxidants, okay? So this is weak. So weak is going to stop that primary at the aldehyde, but keep those secondaries at ketones. Remember, it didn't matter for the secondaries. So don't write OH for the carboxylic acid, write a terminal proton for the aldehyde. Okay, GG. So that one is going to be a primary alcohol right there. That's a secondary and then that's weak. Remember, this is just DCM. It's an inert solvent. Remember, it just helps and aids in the um, reaction conditions. So we're going to get, you know, just that terminal aldehyde and we're gonna get that ketone in the middle, okay? And this is actually very important for orgo too. That's why we picked these problems. They're gonna help you transition. HH, okay, so that's strong oxidation, strong oxidant. Anytime you see oxygen in these oxidation reactions, it's a big sign that's gonna be a strong version of it. And here we have primary. And here, you don't really have a secondary. It's more of a tertiary-like thing because we don't have any protons. There are no protons attached here, none of those, no protons, da, 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 to do any oxidation. So that benzylic, you know, phenol, I guess you could say that phenol is actually gonna stay the way that it is because you can't do that. So this is strong, so we would expect that. And that's that. Okay, so that's it for our main reactions. So then just some other ways that this can be added, and I'm not gonna work through all these, I'm just gonna kinda talk to the main points because you're running out of time here. You could be asked, like we always are see, to rank the following alcohols in terms of their rate of dehydration when you know, subjected to heat and sulfuric acid. But in this situation, what did that, what mechanistic pathway did that go through? Well, we went through a carbocation rearrangement, or carbocation intermediate, excuse me. So if I went through a carbocation intermediate, it's the same exact thing we do with all these ranking problems. Rank them in terms of carbocation stability. So if I were to, you know, potentially erase that, put a primary. If I were to erase that and put, you know, a tertiary there. If I were to erase that and put that there. If I were to erase that and put that there. That should be enough information just based on the stability of these intermediates, you know, which one will go faster. So obviously the one with the best intermediate goes the fastest or the most stable intermediate goes the fastest. Something like that. Okay, and I just did that real quick. So I think you guys, I'll leave B for you guys. Um, clearly, you can see some resonance at play here. That's tertiary, primary, secondary. Think about it like that. Five. Provided below, you have these other alcohols. Circle the ones that are gonna, gonna, going to undergo a rearrangement when they're subjected to dehydration conditions. So we're specifically looking for alcohols that can, you know, either, I guess, even though we discovered this ring expand or, you know, alkyl or methyl ship, alkyl or hydride ships, even though she said, we, we, we determined that we weren't gonna do these ring expansions, let's just for this purposes of this question, kind of identify the ones that could undergo an expansion. So for A, if you had a primary, you could do a hydride ship to get to the benzoic position, so for sure. Um, B, we're a secondary here, but we can do a ring expansion potentially, so yeah, that would work. C, we're secondary, but no subsequent, you know, hydride shifts or methyl shifts are going to increase that stability, so no. D, same thing, no. E, that carbocation is too far removed to do any sort of ring expansion, so no. And then F, we're already at the benzylic position, so no. Okay. And 6A, B, and C, those are just for you. Those are like some nice guide to synthesis. That's, you know, to pull all of your chapter eight, nine, and 10 reactions are in A, B, and C for the most part. And there's some older ones too, but eight, nine, and 10, you know, if you, I mean, I'm sorry, for A, B, and C, you can pretty much uh, uh, guarantee that um, you will be using similar reagents and steps in your synthesis with A, B, and C, if you guys get my drift. So definitely pay attention to these guided synthesis because these are very common. Wink, wink. Okay, so that is, I'm gonna leave you guys there. Um, epoxide chemistry, so let me just talk briefly before you guys leave. Epoxide reactions, I'm not gonna go over them because I don't think they're tested, right? Can someone just verify they're not tested? Oh, they are? Oh. Um, okay, do you guys wanna just like, bang those out real quick, like I did not. In years past, 
we never get to epoxides like in a normal like in-person semester there's not enough time to get and cover all the chapter 11 material which is kind of chapter 10 in this in this situation but we can do it real quick okay oh i didn't realize that i would have went faster okay so we know what sodium i'm just going to talk these through and do them real quick real quick so there are two ways we can make halohydrins i'm sorry there are two ways we can make epoxides i'm sorry we, one of them is the halohydrin route and one of them is going to be with some peroxy you know molecule such as mcpba okay so notice we have the halohydrin route and then on the next page we're going to see the mcpba route okay so for the halohydrin route what you want to do is form a or start with a halohydrin and you can do a subsequent deprotonation step which we saw to form an alkoxide anion you know in chapter 10. so what do i mean by all that what is a halohydrin? And if I don't remember that specific reaction back to you know chapter six, halohydrins were instead of using, you know, let's just say, uh, instead of doing Br2 and DCM, which formed that anti-addition, you know, like I guess vicinal halide, what we did was we substituted that DCM for an actual you know solvent that reacts. And what it was is remember we saw that water attacking at the more substituted position. Because remember, we talked about that partial positive character in that resonance you know, hybrid, which means that that's the most electrophilic position, okay? So that's what a halohydrin is. It's a halogen, halo, and hydrate, so hydrin, okay? So halohydrin. So that's an old chapter six reaction. So make sure you guys know that this was the halohydrin reaction. Once you form that halohydrin, I can take that base that I saw, like sodium hydride, and sodium hydride, can deprotonate that proton, okay, and form that alkoxide nucleophile right here. But something really interesting happens. Here we have an intramolecular reaction where that oxygen next door, this nucleophile, is actually going to form an epoxide bridge because look at that positive character on that carbon that is adjacent to that halogen. What happens is that alkoxide anion is gonna lean over donate its electron density to that deficient carbon and facilitate the removal of that bromide. So we actually get this epoxy bridge, which looks like a triangle, it's kind of weird. And that's how we can form an epoxy. It's these triangles with an oxygen. Don't get these confused with cyclopropanes, okay? Make sure you put an oxygen, okay? Because that's what epoxy is, not that. Or clear, so this is one route to do it. We know chapter six, halohydrin, this was chapter 10, deprotonating, and then chapter 11, showing that that epoxide can lean over and you know, break that carbon bromine bond. Okay, that's one way. The other way, we don't know the mechanism, which is great. So we can just use MCPBA and it goes directly, and it goes directly to this epoxide. And I'll talk about the stereochemistry you know, in a second. Okay, so that is what we're dealing with. So let's do a couple of examples of these, and I can just do acid catalyzed and base catalyzed hydration. Yep. So here, we already have our halohydrin. This base deprotonates that proton. We form this key intermediate. What happens is because of that partial positive character next to that carbon, this is going to come in, donate that out. Do, 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 do. It's done. Okay. And in terms of stereochemistry, uh, this is a chiral center. So uh, what we need to consider, actually, you can do this one of two ways. What I like to do is this. I take this molecule, okay, and I rotate it 90 degrees. A lot of you guys have seen me do this this semester. Take this and rotate it like that and draw the wedge dash orientation. So by that, I mean something like this. Okay, so that's all I did was take this molecule, rotate it like that, and that is where we're at, okay? So, what happens is, is that this reagent could have deprotonated from the top position, or it could have deprotonated from below, okay? It could have, been, it could have done this whole thing below. So, essentially, we could form the epoxide like this, and this doesn't have stereochemistry, whatever, or we could have formed it below. So same thing. Okay, and this one doesn't have stereochemistry. So what I would have done was just translating these, and I'll explain this again in a second, just 
bear with me. Okay, so I know you're like, why did I do it this way? Why did I do this so convoluted? I could have just saw that I generated Carl Center and our wedge dashes. Okay, it's gonna make sense with me, okay? So what happens is, so these are my two cards. These aren't the same thing, by the way. If you flip that down, you see that that's a dash, okay? It's a dash. Anyway, um, what happens is, is we're gonna form our yellow hydrogen here. So we get this bromonium bridge and then, so something like that. And then water comes in and attacks the more substituted position. So something like that. So we're left with this kind of structure. Okay, so you can see the exact same thing that we just worked with, okay? So again, that sodium hydride can either have this oxygen approach from the top face like that, or it could facilitate from the back of it. And it's kind of hard to imagine you know, from this side versus that side, but the result is either this methyl going up or that methyl going down, okay? And it's the same products for, for A and B, essentially. So you kind of see that? This is a little bit more challenging, but we'll keep going. Step one would do that. Step two would do that. Step three is the halohydrin reaction. Okay, so we would get, okay, and this is why I'm saying do it in that orientation where you rotate. So I'm gonna move this just a little bit up, and what you're gonna see is this. If I take that molecule, and I were to rotate it. And I do it as if, okay, I'm gonna do it with this pi bond, as it's still in play. If I take that and I rotate it, it becomes that. And then we can also imagine that, that. Okay, so now that halohydrin could have formed on the top face or the back face of this. And if it formed on the top face, it would have formed an epoxide on the top. So something like this. Okay. But if it formed on the bottom face, it would have formed an epoxide below. Okay. And those are literally my two products. You can, I'll move this up. You can choose to like flip it around or whatever. I always leave it like this on when you don't have written response tests, but in the past, I've always left it like that. That's I'm sure how Dr. Pearson shows it in her specific notes. Like, it's a really good idea to rotate it. I don't know why, like I find it very helpful in terms of like always getting these chiral centers right. Okay. okay, so again, so this D, it was nice and D shows you what I was talking about specifically. This is that orientation that people view it in. You could have formed that halo hydrogen on the top. So something like, you know, maybe the water being here and that, you know, like, you know that, or it could have been, you know, maybe down there and down there. So that's kind of the concept. So basically you form that or you form that. And I am running way over with you guys. So let me just try and finish this with you. Um, MCPBA, DCM is another route, but we don't know the mechanism. But again, it's the same thing. So you can basically imagine that we have either this one or we have the below one. Okay, so this is just directly there, okay? That's it. This one you can see is a reduction to the E alkene and then you can go right to the epoxide there. Same thing here, this is gonna be a halogenation at the more substitute position. We're gonna do elimination and then you can do that epoxide at this end, okay? So let me just talk about opening and closing and all these things. So we talked about forming them, now we have to talk about opening them. So under acidic conditions, we attack the more substituted position. Under basic conditions, we attack the less substituted position. Okay. Um, so essentially, I know I'm doing this really fast, but you're gonna form an epoxide from all of these. So let's just look at L specifically. And you're gonna form an epoxide that maybe looks like this. Okay, and then the more substitute position is the one with the two methyl groups. The less substitute position is that one. Okay, so then that means that this, you know, nucleophile, this ethyl, this ethyl alcohol, or ethanol actually, ethanol is actually the alcohol you drink. This is the molecule of the alcohol you drink. And what happens is it attacks here, okay, breaks this carbon oxygen bond, okay, 
And first, I'm sorry, the first step was this being pronated. I didn't show that, my bad. That acid, you know, complexes with this like we've seen before. Okay, and then this epoxide will grab the proton, becomes pronated, and once it does that, this ethanol can just attack there and then open the bridge. So you're left with kind of this zigzag structure. Okay, and that is your structure. Okay, so it's kind of hard to visualize this kind of opening, but basically it's always this da da da, like da da da, kind of like how we saw with the trans Newman projections. It's always that. Okay, let's just look at another quick example. Let's look at O. So this is acidic conditions. So what happened? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm on, I'm on basic conditions. That was weird. Oh, I put them together. Okay, so that was acidic conditions. This is basic conditions. So Remember, basicity parallels nucleophilicity. And the logic behind why that this is this epoxide is attacked at the more substitution for acidic conditions is when you see this, oops, what, that is not an epoxide. You can tell how fast I'm rushing. If you were to draw resonance structures, you'd a carbocation in there. If you were to draw that resonance structure, you would get A primary. So you see, the more substitute position is the more stable carbocation. That's why the nucleophile likes to attack that electrophile the best. Okay, and that is why acid catalyzed hydration, where you see acid present, you're going to attack there. But for basic conditions, remember, basicity parallels nucleophilicity. So if this is a, you know, a good nucleophile, it's a good base as well. So that wants to attack the less sterically hindered that side. So that's why this is the steric argument, not the carbocation argument. So this one is going to attack the less substituted side because of sterics, open it like that. And the last step is going to be just the protonation of that alkoxide anion. But remember, this is SN2. So SN2 is the back face. So that would be SPH and then finally, and this is literally the end of epoxide. So I know I only did one example of each, but I kept you guys long enough. That should be, you know, good. Um, so just keep in mind, there are two ways to form this. So there's four reactions in this chapter. The first way to do it is form a halo hydrin and then deprotonate that hydrogen to, you know, facilitate the closing of that bridge. And the second one is using some sort of peroxide like MCPB directly from an alkene. Those are the two ways to make it. Then... Uh, would OB racemic? No, it would not be. Those are, um, it is one specific product. Okay, you're not going through a carbocation. And then the two ways to open them, so you know, two ways to form them, two ways to open them. If it's acidic conditions, we're talking that resonance argument where you're going to attack the more substituted side for the reasons we talked about carbocations. For basic conditions, we're using that steric argument. We're going to attack the less substituted side because that's what SN2 conditions like. Remember, it's inversion of configuration, so you exclusively get that one stereo isomer. All right. And with that, it's been a pleasure working with you guys all semester. And I wish you guys good luck. Don't be a stranger. Reach out. I'll probably, you know, um, send an email maybe with some of my Orgo 2 materials um, at, the end of the, at the end of the test tomorrow. Um, good luck.